Hello and welcome to Pod Songs, where we interview inspirational people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. And today, the episode is truly inspiring. It's really one of my favorite episodes so far because we get Zaya Stalling from the band The Copper Children to come on and interview Max Frieda, who goes into refugee camps to teach children how to paint. The man is an angel. And they have this wonderful shared history. Zaya's father was Max's art teacher in school. So there's this fantastic chemistry before, between these super creative kind of stepbrothers. It's a very interesting and wonderful dynamic. And at the end, of course, is a song inspired by this conversation. It's a beautiful piece called Art Can Change the World. So I won't spoil it for you any more than that. So please smash the like button, subscribe. This is well over our 150th episode, so if you're just joining us, you've got a lot of catching up to do. We're releasing an episode every month, so subscribe and you'll be notified. Go to podsongs.com, sign up to the mailing list, and please share on social media. Okay, let's speak to Zaya of the Copper Children. Zaya, welcome to Podsongs. Hey, Jack. Thanks for having me. It's a great to catch up with you again. It was two years ago. I counted. <laughs> and we recorded the episode. We started this process, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've it's... grown so much since then. We have. Your hair has got shorter. Yeah, yeah. It just grew in. It's weird. <laughs> I don't know how that. Do some sort of kundalini exercise. When yeah. You're bringing it. I'm not losing hair. I'm just in the inner. I'm growing inner. In yeah, the, yeah. Inner. but this has been um it's been an amazing process working with you on this track yeah it has yeah, yeah. Oh, it's worth it been worth it the whole process because maybe we should just give i've told people a bit about you while you were in the waiting room but um maybe we just for people that don't know about the copper children maybe we could just in talk a bit about you and your new albums coming out you've got tour dates coming up um you know how long you've been doing this and uh you know just a little bit about you yeah well uh yeah i mean we're gonna be touring in the fall we're going up to the east to like carolinas and then up in new york and yeah we're working on a new album for next year um copper children has been together nine years now it started as Zaya and the Copper Children and it started as just um me being a 19 20 year old kid just uh, just having a wild idea to be a musician and um I moved back to Denver to kind of just start a project and I went to this songwriting expo and I met a man named Joel Ashmore and um I didn't know what to do exactly, so I assumed he just record an album. So that's what I wanted to do. And Joel had a studio, so I went to a studio and we started just workshopping. Over the next year, we um, through these songs that I had written, we um, put together an album and with a bunch of older musicians in Denver that were his friends and became my friends, and. Um, yeah, we created this Copper Child album, which was my first album. And uh, and then, you know, they were all older and I was very young and ready to do, you know, live the wild rock and roll lifestyle. So um, I kind of took a break for a bit and then I set an intention because I always wanted to really, I, I wanted to kind of find people who wanted to just play music anytime, get up in the morning and... um. And so I kind of met this community and through through that I slowly piece by piece met the band and which was a, a group of I always said, you know, I, I would know what I was looking for because they'd have this um wild, insane they'd have this like uh five percent insanity in their <laughs> eyes to actually do something. So uh so yeah, piece by piece it kind of magically happened. Like I met our drummer Chris at an open mic and then him and I jammed with our friend Elias who would then go on to be in, he would be in our band for a short time and then he would just form a band called Los Mocochetes. Um, and then uh, 
and then and then I met Andy at this ecstatic dance, um, who's the bass player. And Andy and my mom were my mom met Andy first, and she was like, "You need to, you need to meet Andy." So I saw him sing, and and uh, and then Elijah, who was an original member, was a percussionist who had happened to be playing with Andy. So we all kind of came together, and Andy was like, "I play the bass because I had a gig," and and then we played a gig, and and someone was asking me like. How'd you guys do it? And I was like, well, we didn't really do it. It just kind of, we played a gig and we had fun. So we did it again. And then we just kept doing it. And I, I, I always had a dream of having a group that was like, uh, like a, the Beatles or like Led Zeppelin that was more like the sum of its parts than it was individual members. So. At some point, I just decided to call to call it the Copper Children instead of Zaya and the Copper Children because I felt like, to me, that just created a separation that I didn't want. Mm. Yeah, and now it's nine years later, and we're rocking in our yeah, many was... national tours. We have yeah. yet to get international, but yeah. Well, come on over to Italy. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> <laughs> your girlfriend's Sicily, and you've got a you can get probably get a passport. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta get the, gotta check it out. Yeah, but it's the—I mean, it's the whole package with you guys. It's the great songs. Your voice is such so distinctive. You know, it's such a, such a relaxed vibe on every track. It's really a, a, a psychedelic uh, sounds. I really love the groove you guys capture. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. So with this, um, with this episode, we're really going down your memory lane, aren't we? Maybe we should talk a little bit about who our guest is. And how you came into contact with him? Yeah, it's it's cool because you know you had hit me up and we had bounced back some ideas and um, we really landed on something very special. Yeah, he's his name is Max Frieder. Uh, he was a former student of my dad's, and I actually remember him as a kid, and he was one of my dad's kind of stand out, like one of you know, like he. He was in all my dad's classes and very, you know, he loved my dad. And um, my dad definitely helped him to kind of develop his artistic sensibilities um, and create a, a really beautiful young foundation. But yeah, Max Frieder went on to create Art Illusion, as we know, which is um, a really amazing program that goes into high... Um, I, I guess you could say uh, like refugee camps all over the world and, and places where there's um, people are really having a hard time and he creates art. He, he brings art supplies there and they create sculptures and, and do painting. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And he's doing it, you know, not just with refugees, right. But with like, just like at risk areas, which is exactly where, we need it. we need it the most obviously yeah because with this podcast we want to do songs to people in service to others and you really pulled out a gem you know i would never have i would never have heard this guy but to see the videos of him going into these these refugee camps with these children who've been through these terrible experiences and, and he's got them laughing and they're pl throwing paint on a wall and these beautiful murals they come up with and bringing color into a refugee camp i couldn't think of a of a better th way to spend your life i know it was when uh when we were interviewing him i definitely felt like very humbled yeah <laughs> felt like i could be doing more <laughs> we both did yeah he was sure. very cool is... it was such a fun conversation and you the listener should also have the same feeling yeah yeah we i mean honestly we all need to have that feeling because yes. we're sitting here sweating smoke-filled skies you know yeah, yeah, it's definitely some alarming, some alarming, um, you know, calls to action. Mm, yeah, yeah, so many crises, yeah. and um, so we're going to give the proceeds to this song to his charity, Art Illusion, and yeah, people can also go on there and donate. I mean, we're having this pre-chat before to get everyone excited for the for the interview, which is amazing. Yeah, as they should be. Yeah, <laughs> and that you should take action. So. You know, 
go to the uh, website for Art Illusion. I'll put a link in the show notes and make a donation because those guys really are doing amazing work. It's like activism and art. You know, it's really art to service and they're a big inspiration. It was really I'm hearing you two guys speak even, you know, two years, two years later, I'm still buzzing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember when you re re listening to the, the audio of the interview, it was like, I forgot how, how beautiful it was. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, it was interesting because the song, how it ended up. Yeah. Um, it just popped out of that moment. Like I listened to the interview and then I pulled out this um, bag and it had this news clipping and it had my dad who was in the movie had a picture of him from like, probably like the nineties. And um, I just, it just was like, look, everything. And then I just like picked up a guitar and it just kind of came out. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful one. The lyrics as well. Art can change the world. Let's support. Give people that we're only going to give you the title for the moment. You have yeah, to yeah. listen to the end of the show to hear yeah, the complete exactly. song. You got to go all the way. Yeah. And you, but you really pulled out all the lyrics from the song, from the interview as well. And uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Creating yeah. art from something like that. It's a, it was a unique experience. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to keep people waiting too long. I yeah. Keep people hear this interview. Yeah. And um, but you've got your new album coming because we're, we're we're recording this now. The interview goes out in a few weeks. So, welcome to the Weirdo Rodeo is coming out soon as well. Your next full length album. Yeah, we 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 um we're we're shooting to get it out in the probably by sometime in like spring next year. Oh, I was like, oh. Yes. yeah. So it's gonna be a little bit, but we do have a single coming out called Deep Inside My Heart. Okay. And we just released a uh, live EP called The Studious Sessions. So you can check that out. Right. And um, yeah, look look out for us if you're in the East Coast, in, in the Carolinas or up in New York or playing in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. And so people can go in to your fall. website, thecopperchildren.com, yep. sign up for your mailing list. Um, how else can they support you? Are you on Patreon or anything like that? Um, I mean, you can follow us on social media, follow us on Instagram. Um, I don't believe we're on Patreon, but, uh, we probably should be. <laughs> You've got some great merch as well. Some super t-shirts. Yeah. yeah. Buy a shirt. Get a vinyl. And, uh, all right. Well, this has been great catching up with you again. Yeah, it has. And I'm sure people want to hear the interview now. So let's segue. All right. Let's see this. I apologize for the delay. Good morning. Flash. What's up? You. What's up? How are you guys doing? Good. Right. How are you doing? Doing really good. Doing really good. Zia, it's so good to see you after like many years. I know, man. My, yeah. my, my wild morning situation. Because <laughs> you're on mountain time. Yeah, you got the last of it, so... Right. <laughs> and and yeah, Jack, it's like the evening for you, right? Yeah, I'm at the end of the day, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. totally. Yeah. Oh man, well, th thank you both for bringing this together. I mean, I think this is a this is an awesome opportunity to be able to talk about some some incredible stuff, so I'm just really looking forward to it. We're both very excited. I, mean, we learned, I learned about your history and I can't believe that uh, Isaiah's father was your, your art teacher. So yeah. cool, right? Yeah, absolutely incredible. So, well, tell us all about it then. I mean, this is, I really just want to hear the, the story. So you guys go ahead. Awesome. Um, okay, well, I, I can start. I'll talk a little bit about it. So, yeah, but why don't I start in high school? I usually don't, but I think this is very fitting, right? Um, yeah, I was, uh, um, when I was in high school, I had uh, an incredible mentor 
Um, his name was David Stallings. And he was, what was really cool is that there was this program where you could actually apply to get a studio space as a high school student where you would actually be able to get all the canvas and all the paint and everything that you could kind of like imagine to be able to make art. And I was like, okay, I really want to do this. It's like my goal. And I went and I had this whole summer program in metal art. And he was like, you know, I really think you need to like do one more class before you get up. Like, oh, okay, okay. And I did this extra class. I worked really hard and I got the studio. And I ended up being able to make all these paintings and all of this work that, um, that later on in life, I realized I like might not get that opportunity ever again. Like being able to have all the paint and canvas and art supplies, everything you want, like for free in a studio space is like impossibly difficult to get in life. Um, and so, and so that kind of opened up these amazing conversations where I would just stay late every day talking about the universe and the world. And, um, it ended up setting me off this, on this really kind of incredible path of going to art school, um, where I ended up going to a place called RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. And when I was there, I got really into the idea of like, okay, if I'm making art, art like has this amazing capacity to make social good. Like it has this, um, this transformational ability to make durable change and especially for children. And so I started to work with kids doing the neural projects and realizing, oh man, this is something, this is something special. Like this is kind of magical. Um, and had this, had this kind of, uh, let's say alchemy of taking something that was nothing and turning it into something absolutely profound. And so through that process, I, I was lucky enough to start to work in New Zealand in the excuse me, in the um, Maori communities later on in the Aboriginal communities, the first Maori communities, and working with incarcerated kids, um, kids who've been through the prison system and especially kids whose parents were in gangs. And, and seeing these kids make this giant canvas mural, which was then displayed on the entrance of the police station where they all got arrested uh and seeing their faces and like seeing what that was able to do was like oh my god this is this is amazing and so and i'm traveling around the country doing about 10 different mural projects there and then working in latin america doing uh working in costa rica on the border of uh, uh, uh of, i believe it was panama at the time um but mostly with the, with indigenous communities i'm really seeing oh man this is like this is so important like being able to have kids making art that they get to keep in their community and that their whole community says wow maybe our kids had more talent than we ever thought that they had. Maybe this is something that can be a really big kind of shift in the way that we perceive what art can function as. And so um, after I, I graduated from, from undergrad, I was like, okay, we got to like, I, I, you know, I got to figure out how to make this like work. Like I actually think this needs to be something important. And when I was in New Zealand, I actually, when we started, I was like, okay, this is like an art illusion. This is like an evolution. It's like, evolution. it's like a resolution to problems. It's like a revolution, uh, maybe in the next phase of the arts and trying to think what could be possible. And, um, and so I bought that domain name that day and it was artillution.org. Um, thinking like one day it'll become like the global international organization and it's going to be, and you know, this huge, incredible thing. And, but really it was just like me going around, like doing projects. And so I ended up meeting my co-founder, um, his name was Joel Bergner, and he was doing kind of the same work that I was doing, um, you know, in Latin America and Australasia. He was doing it largely in Brazil. And, and, and we started to talk and I met him in New York and, um, and I ended up doing a whole bunch of work in Israel and Palestine um, and did a lot of work with Israeli and Palestinian youth uh, who had, whose families had been in conflict, especially people who'd, who'd had family members who were killed and had had this really transformational experience of seeing what was possible in conflict zones. Um, I ended up being there for the first and the second Gaza wars in 2014 uh, for the whole conflict, working with the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate and working with the State Department and the United Nations, uh, who ended up getting very involved in the work that we did. And what got really intense is then I ended up starting to meet, um, and I met Joel, and we ended up go, meeting, working together in the uh, Syrian refugee camps on the border of Syria in Jordan, in Zaatari and Azraq refugee camps. And so then seeing, you know, that was my first time really encountering refugee camps um, on a really large scale. I'd been working in Palestinian refugee camps, which were small, but hadn't worked in Syrian refugee camps, which in these, you know, the Zadari camp, when people were coming in back in 2014, it was just like people were, were thousands of people were coming in every day. And it was a, and it was a hugely transformational experience of saying, oh my God, like these kids so badly need to have a way of expressing themselves. There's so many 
talented, passionate, driven, dedicated artists who don't have the, who don't have the, the opportunity to be able to make art. Uh, we need to figure out ways that we can take this incredible social capital and be able to then actually share the opportunity with them so that they can then go and work with the children and the communities that they live with every day. And, and, and through that experience, I ended up getting the chance to kind of open it up and start to travel to more locations and work in more spaces, um, working in, in the Aboriginal communities in, um, in Australia. And one of the things that happened through a bizarre series of events is I was invited to work on an Australian innovation think tank on an expedition in Antarctica. And when I was there, uh, I got to meet some really incredible people. I was uh, doing graphic recording and thought visualizations for all these top innovators and entrepreneurs. And it was a very crazy experience. But three of the guys were like, we love what you do. We think it's extremely important. We think it's the most important thing happening on the ship. We want to invest in it. And they ended up creating an anonymous donor platform and raised a little bit of money. And that became like our first like pot of funding where then actually one of those three guys became one of our founding board members. So we ended up developing a board of directors. We ended up getting incorporated and really being able to build an entire, much more sustainable structure rather than these two random nomadic artists traveling around the world doing this work. Um, and, and what that really resulted in was having our board and we had a, an advisory council. We ended up having a team, the, 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 the team that we started in New York. We said, this isn't enough. We need to really train artists and build teams at each of these different locations around the globe. So that became our focus. And we ended up expanding first, starting in the Syrian refugee camps, which is our first team of artists, starting with two guys, <coughs> Muhammad Ibrahim and Samir. And then it really ended up growing. So we worked extensively in, I uh, started working during the genocide in 2017 in Myanmar started working on the border in Bangladesh in the largest refugee camp in human history, which is the Rohingya refugee camp currently. Uh, so I started in, in 2017 and, um, and that, that was a huge deal because it had, it's now got almost one, one to 1.2 million people living in a refugee camp, which is very hard to fathom what that means. And so, and so because of that, it really comes like, okay, well, if this can exist here, it can exist anywhere. And, um, and actually directly after that, we started working in the largest refugee settlement in Africa, which is in Uganda on the border of South Sudan. And so we started a program there as well. And then in, in, uh, on the, with Venezuelan refugees working in Colombia and with internally displaced people, uh, working in Cali, uh, in, in, in the center of, of Colombia. And we would, and then we started doing extensive programs here in the U S and working in New York, in DC, we've done a lot of work. We've done work in Colorado, California, uh, mostly working with asylum seekers, working with LGBTQ youth and homeless, uh, homelessness people, working with folks who have special needs, working with people who are, um, who are re resettled refugees and saying, okay, across all these contexts around the world, we, we actually worked in about 35 countries internationally, um, but we really focused on those regions um, and said, what in each continent? And that the main focus became, okay, what matters the most is having local artists being able to work with kids to be able to make a transformational change where they can tell their stories and they can make those stories come to life in a way that's locally contextualized and that's able to have a durable, sustainable approach where it's not a one-time project, but it's something that can last over the long run, especially, and maybe most importantly, that it's actually refugees who are leading it for themselves, right? And that it's folks who many times are considered to be, you know, beneficiaries or those who are in need of help. Actually, like they're the ones who most importantly need to be helping their own communities or to be serving or to be sharing. Um, and that's where our evolution really grew from. And so now we have uh, just over... 80 artists around the world who are running programs year round. Uh, we have country managers in five different locations uh, or five country programs with country managers. And what's really grown out of this is that starting with that initial, initial seedling with David Stallings is mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it showed me, you know, why do I get the right to have a, at the age of, you know, 15 to have a studio and by the way, it's a public school, right? But, to have to have a studio and a and brushes and paint and everything that any artist could ever dream of. Why do I get the right to have this? And then a kid who's in southern Bangladesh and Caucasus Bazaar, you know, on the border of Myanmar, like, why don't they get to have this? Like, why don't they have the right to have this? And not just a kid, but anybody. And and really realizing, okay, how can we democratize creativity? And how can we create a real 
substantial transformative change to be able to really shift how arts in crisis contexts and traumatized communities can make an indelible impact into what we perceive the value of the arts to be. And I think that value is inherently embedded in this idea that we, we need to build bridges, right? We need to plant these seeds and those seeds need to be watered constantly. Um, and, you know, through resource distribution and, and reallocation of funds and through taking creativity, because for me, I'm an artist and an educator, but as time has gone on, I've realized, okay, I need to use that as an inspiration to maybe do all the things that I, you know, never thought you'd have to do, like, you know, governance and insurance and, you know, fundraising and all these things that are the, uh, let's say the scaffolding for that orb of light. And that orb of light is that, you know, myself and, and Zia and, and for those who make art in the world, like everybody needs the right to make art in the world. And I think it's our job to be able to advocate for that however we can every single day, like on this podcast. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to, I don't want to hog it too much, but it's, um, but that's at least a little, little tidbit into the story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. oh, and I should add that like that whole story that I just told, uh, throughout, especially the Rohingya camps, um, I started doing, um, my master's in doctoral research. So in five years of doctoral research on this, really looking at what do we see as behavioral changes and how do we really kind of monitor and evaluate these programs? Um, right. and then finished my doctorate. We were actually pretty recently, uh, just a, a couple of years ago, um, for this work at Teachers College of Columbia. So we say, okay, how do we take like the really, the, the core artistic part and then try to put the real kind of thought out methodology behind it. And um, I think that then adds this kind of like, cause the whole thing's kind of a crazy story and then it tries to ground it a little bit as well. So yeah, it's definitely been quite a journey and adventure, uh, no question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what would your dad say about that? I don't know. <laughs> and he he's very proud, you know. He he he's the one who's been kind of keeping me posted about Max. So they stay in touch. Um, but I know he's very proud. Um, and he should be. I mean, like you're you're an impressive human. I'm proud of you, man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Well, I, fo I followed your music. And I love it. I think your music is so good, man. And I'm like, I'm oh, going to put away. It's been, by the way, just so you know, Jack, it's been like 10 years or more since we've seen each other. Like this yeah. call, like, wow. like this yeah. Uh, spoke. <laughs> God, so, but can we do a song about this then? I mean, are you feeling inspired? To, to... <laughs> I mean, yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot of material. Too much material. I'm going to have to condense. <laughs> I have to pull out the the thesaurus <laughs> no mm -hmm. <laughs> totally 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 <laughs> i think that just i mean what's it like to go into a refugee camp that first time when you've never been there before and yeah man i think it um it's very jolting i think it's something where you have to mentally and emotionally prepare yourself for going into those spaces um I think once you've been in one space, it gives you a big perspective on other spaces as well. So it's like, you know, when you end up going, so when I first went into the Syrian refugee camps with, with Joel, it was, it was extremely, um, you know, you like kind of can't believe that you're there. And then when you're there, you're like, well, I'm here for a purpose. Like I was doing this big project, painting a giant canvas mural with, you know, a hundred kids and we did this giant piece. And it was this amazing experience where in the middle of it, there was a huge riot. And so all the kids, we had to get, you know, they had to get the kids back to like where they lived. And then we were in a compound and then we had to lock down the compound. And basically, the, or no, and excuse me, they were like, okay, we need to be evacuated in three minutes. So, you know, you have to leave all our supplies, leave everything, like just take yourselves and three minutes are going to be evacuated with the military. So we're like, okay, uh, so we get all of our stuff together. We'll like run to get everything. And then they're like, nope, there's no time to evacuate. The riot has spread too quickly. So you're just going to lock down the compound and you're going to stay in this compound while there's the riot. And, and I was sitting there uh, and we literally ended up just staying in this compound for about three or four hours. Um, and we were with the, the workers of the uh, international NGO we were working with, uh, which was called Mercy Corps. And, and we were working with Mercy Corps and they were all Syrians. 
And so we're sitting there with the Mercy Corps folks, just painting, continuing to work on the painting. <laughs> and this guy and the two guys, uh, I'm trying to remember their name. The, 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 I remember this epitomizes the story. This guy's like, oh, let me tell you about my story. He's like, I always loved art. He said, I was moved to that. And I, and I always loved making art. It was super important to me. And, and he's like, but, you know, recently I had the craziest thing happen. And I was like, oh, like what happened? He was like, oh, yesterday I was like talking to my brother and he was telling me about Syria and he's fighting in the Free Syrian Army and we're having this phone call. And then like I hear, Zoo! and he's like, and he's like, yeah, let me show it to you. And he, and he was audio recording the call and he starts playing the call and you can hear them talking. And then you hear, yes, and then, and then you hear them talking and, and then you hear him screaming and then you hear another and then, and then he's like, and then you hear the phone go dead and he's like, yep. And now my brother's dead. That was the last time I talked to him, which was yesterday. And this is happening to all of our families and this is reality. And it was this really intense moment where I spoke really closely with Mufle and it was, and it's like, you know, we're experiencing loss every day. And little and, and having an opportunity to do something positive, making art, doing something that gives us a reason to wake up in the morning is so important. Like I remember him saying that he was like laughing and smiling. And I'm like, this is like, this is wild to me, you know, that you can have such trauma and such kind of conflict induced shock. And yet at the same time, also saying like, yo, we get, we have to find ways to bring hope and to bring inspiration and aspiration and you know, all the things that make life worth living. And, and that is inherently bonded together, right? Resilience and trauma are very bonded together. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that really stuck out to me and thinking like Mufle and like these artists that we're working with, like they really deserve the opportunity to bring that types, that type of resilient based experience to their own community. That's what I would say my first experience. That was like my first experience. <laughs> 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 well, what about the children then? I mean, they must have been, did they painting pictures? Did it help them cope with their experiences or? Yeah. I mean, that's, and in that, I mean, in that situation, we were painting all big animals and inspired them that they find there's something important with, but every place that we go, the whole point is that the art is that the children come up with the concepts. They're the one who came up with the story. They have an interactive narrative experience. And then they're actually then, uh, painting. So they're the ones who are actually bringing the paintings to life and the artists are facilitating it so that it ends up becoming a giant cohesive piece of art. But the whole idea is that it's the children, right? I mean, this is what I look at every day and where I currently live, but like every day I'm just like reminded, like, that's like the reason why we do this work, right? It's like, it's about, it's about them being able to find a real way. It's not painting my numbers, right? But mm -hmm. actually them painting that cow that they had that that you know that they, they had to leave behind in Myanmar their mother that they haven't seen because she was separated in South Sudan or you know their grandmother who you know was killed in gang violence in you know in Colombia or whatever it might be some way of being able to create something deeply meaningful through the process of creating public art that lives in the community. And I should say that, you know, in addition to painting murals, we, we do extensive, um, and this really goes up Zia's alley. We have, we have a program that we started called the Foundstrument Soundstrument Project. Uh, and, and where we actually build interactive musical sculptures out of trash and recycled materials that are public, where we teach about the environment, sustainability, recycling, and then actually get the kid, get, get groups of kids to cl collect a ton of trash, clean all the trash, paint all of it, bolt it together, build giant sculptures, have drumsticks attached to it, and then do giant performances as well, um, connected both to the sculptures, but then also we have a performance workshop that we lead. I even do it some puppetry as well, as, as well as different types of dance. And so, um, you know, and, and including even fashion and costume making. And so we have all different types of programs where we realize, okay, we need to provide a whole series of options so that the, the artists in these communities can choose what matters most to them, right? And how they're going to impact their community in the most impactful and deeply meaningful way. Yeah, because we're going to ask about music, obviously, because the opportunity for bands to go over there and help or, or local musicians, they must... Because all these people, you know, ref they say refugee, don't they? It's like stuck on people's foreheads. And, but these are all, some of them are probably amazing musicians, amazing painters come over, uh, all types of people now. It's just, you know, you've, you've got a ready-made, it's a community there ready to go. No? 
Well, and this is one of the things is it's like, you know, I remember there's this amazing story that I had where it was where I was in this, the Rohingya refugee camps in 2017. And I was at a close call of mine named Adamost and, um, and I was walking and I was like, okay, we need to find artists. Like we need to find incredible local artists. Cause I, I was thinking the same thing that you just said, like there are amazing artists here. You just need to find them. Right. And every person I asked was like, there are no local artists. There are no artists. I said, what do you mean? There's no artists. That's impossible. They said, well, all artists would get killed in Myanmar if they came out as being an artist. Yeah. So, so nobody was, was allowed to be an artist. And I said, well, that's not, you know, that's not possible that every artist, that there are no artists just because people weren't allowed to be artists. That doesn't mean there aren't artists. You just need to look really hard and you'll find them. And so I literally just knocked on doors, like every door, every person that I met for weeks of walking around the camp, I just said, we need to find artists. Now, if I had been asking for craftsmen, artisans, right, mm -hmm. or seamstresses or you know, you know, tapestry makers, I probably would have found some incredible artists, but I wasn't thinking that I was thinking the way that you just thought I would need to find artists. Right. And so, and so after weeks of looking at up finding Muhammad Noor and Muhammad Hassan, and these two guys came up to me and said, well, we're not really sure for artists, but we always loved making art. And Muhammad Hassan, excuse me, Muhammad Noor ended up telling me, he said, yo, uh, just to be totally honest, like when I was at home, my mother told me that I would never be allowed to make art because all artists get killed. And so what I would do is I would make, I would take pieces of charcoal from the fire and I make drawings and pieces of trash. And then I would bury them so that no one would find them. Yeah. And he said, I, my dream was to always be an artist. And he's like, when, I, when we ran, when our village was burned and, you know, we had to dig holes in the ground to be able to bury ourselves during the, the daytime and at night we would run. And when I finally got across and I had a series of family members that were killed and when we got across the river into Bangladesh, right, the, 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 the biggest thing that that's happened to me was meeting is meeting you is being able to say that I could become an artist, right? After months of looking for some kind of work and after months of working with us, he came back up to me and he was like, Hey, my mother told me, mashallah. Isn't it crazy? This is the way he's phrasing it to me. And he speaks some English, which is amazing because very few do. Isn't it crazy that we had to lose everything that we had, lose our home, we had to lose everything that we owned. And yet now I get to pursue my dreams of being an artist. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like, by the will of God, this has happened, right? This is, the, this is a conversation that I had with him. And you look at it and you think, yeah, they're artists. And then we ended up finding these incredible folkloric musicians. These incredible uh, Rohingya musicians who play their traditional instruments, these very specific type of a mandolin and a very specific type of a flute. And, um, and, and we got very passionate about him coming and teaching. It was an old, an older man who joined our team, who was able to teach about folklore of music. So we've had all these musicians in the different areas we work with around the world who then come out and brought music into the programs we do, which has been really incredible as well. Really fits in with, with, with Zia. Yeah, as Ed was talking about when we first started talking, I was like, oh my God, Zia, like, this is exactly, you know, there's a huge overlap in what you do um, and with, with the work that we do as well. Yeah, man, it's, uh, it's beautiful to hear your stories. They're, they're very inspiring. I, I'm going to just side note real quick and just, my, my name is pronounced Zaya. Just the, Zaya! Oh my God, I'm it's so okay. sorry. It's a, no, no, it's okay. I just want to, I know it wrong. <laughs> It's all what are you good. doing, Jack? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. What are we doing? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so, but, all right, go no, on. I was going to ask you, Zaya. So, you know, for, like, have you performed in like a range of different types of spaces, like with different kind of communities or populations here in the States? Um, you know, I mean, we've done like, we've done a, a good amount of touring around. Um, we've played a lot of festivals, a lot of venues. We've played you know, we played little fundraisers and, um, um, there's a lot of community out here, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people that are trying to do, um, beautiful things. Um, we've, we've done fundraisers to help raise money for, you know, the houses on Pine Ridge. Um, in, I think it's, it's like on the border of Nebraska and South Dakota. Um, yeah, we, we've, we've performed at music festivals. We've performed, um, at venues. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, uh, 
traveled the country playing music, <laughs> I always kind of use the example, like, because I, I, I think my brain kind of, Jack and I were talking, but I have a deep passion for kind of like the mystical and the mythological. And I think sometimes like my brain turns my life into a cartoon. Uh, but sometimes like, you know, uh, as the Copper children, we just formed and we were like, all right, let's get, we did an album. We did it ourselves and we were like, all right, let's hit the road. And um, I always kind of used this, uh, I had this vision of my, in my head of like, us like in this tour van and like we're we're like bouncing down the road cartoonized and like we're like grabbing the wheel as it's coming off the <laughs> the bus and like duct taping it back on like as we're going and that's kind of like um I, that's kind of like to me what what it was what what we've been like is just kind of like let's hit the road and like oh is this is this van ready to ride <laughs> it's like i don't know let's let's try it out you know, and we're like duct taping it <laughs> together as we go down the road, you know. Um, so it's been a fun journey of just kind of, you know, for me, I'm not like, uh, I, I I have to kind of dive headfirst into stuff. So, you know, I, I as a musician, it's just it's like, you know, I, I was like, can I get through high school just so I can really jump into music and like, um, it's just been a series of like, um, you know, kind of get it, throwing it together and, and, you know, getting what I can done out. Um, and, uh, yeah, creating, um, just creating based on this feeling I have, like, I need, I need to put this out and I don't exactly know how, and I don't know how it's going to happen and I don't know where it's going to come from or where the money's going to come from or who the people are, but I'm just putting it out there and like trusting fully that like, that I'm going to go on a great adventure. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I admire that like in more ways than I can say, you know, cause I feel like what's interesting is I feel like <laughs> the way hearing you talk about that is like the same as like the first half of my work. Like, because it was like, I just like grab a giant backpack and be like, all right, what happens if we go into a Palestinian refugee camp? Like with a whole, with a whole bunch of buckets of paint and like literally, or like it, or the Rohingya camps I was talking about where there's literally just like a backpack, we had a thousand dollar budget for two months. And we're just like, okay, what, you know, what can we make happen? Right? Like out of nothing, like, let's just get, let's get some paint, let's get some brushes, let's find some walls. Let's just make some art. Let's collect some trash. Let's build some giant. Let's wire stuff up. Let's zip tie stuff up. Let's find some drumsticks. If not, okay, let's get some sticks and just break them off some trees and just like make some music and make some art and let's let's just make it happen. And that was the initial ethos and pathos, which is very similar to yours. like duct taping it, like the, the amount of colors of duct tape that I would carry, like absolutely, like everywhere, you know. And I would have like a giant. And it was funny because I remember there were kids who called me a turtle because so everywhere I'd go, I'd have a giant backpack full of art supplies and, and like, and I had like, um, um, and like a Gouda drum, like a, like a musical drum that you could play that I bring and different. And, and, and I bring a like creature suit that I could perform in and, you know, and, and, and I bring all this stuff and I love that. Like, I like being this kind of, you know, nomadic artist. It was something that I just, I loved and I, you know, didn't stay in one place for more than two months, two to three months in about 10 years, something along those lines, you know, and about in many years, eight years of just traveling nonstop, you know, and, and it's very similar to what you said there, right? What got kind of crazy, what gets crazy is that it was like, okay, so we set up all these programs and doing these trainings, teaching local artists how to make this happen. They're making it happen and it's growing and it's growing from just me and my co-founder to being us with all these different artists around the world. And then it was like, oh, like now this is like real, like this is like grown. And it's not just like me and my co-founder just like traveling around the world doing this work. Like we need to be able to make sure that like they have food on their table. Like we need to make sure that like we get long-term contracts and that we have relationships with institutions like UNICEF and UNHCR and the Red Cross to work in the refugee camps, not just to come and do a one-time project, but to support it on a long-term basis. And to do that, that that's real work. Like when I say real work, I mean, it's really hard work. It's real work yeah. going and being the like nomadic artist. That's, that is the real work as well. They're both the real work, but it's, you know, sitting for a year 
on a computer doing nothing but organizing programs for artists who would never have that opportunity otherwise, it's really challenging. You sacrifice your painting. You sacrificed. Yeah. And, and it becomes this weird thing where I'm like, okay, do I sacrifice myself or me or, or my company? Do we sacrifice ourselves as artists? Or, or is it more like we've seen what happens for people who don't get this opportunity? And unless we fight really hard for this to happen and for a redistribution of resources into the arts and education in spaces that never get support for the arts, right? It's just not going to happen, right? We're the ones who have access to the United States and to funders and to people who would be interested in this, where Dildar Begum or Anwara or Rifa or Rishmi or, you know, our teams who are living in, in a space where they're locked inside of a camp, they don't have that opportunity to advocate for for uh, a redistribution of, of uh, priorities and values, really, and saying that creativity in the arts matters. And so it's this weird thing where in many ways, to be 100% honest, I sometimes like fantasize about what Zaya's talking about because it's like, I lived that life yeah. and I still live that life of like driving down the road with a duct tape, like one wheel going in head and you're like building an airplane while you're flying it and you're, <laughs> you know, it, that that feeling, like I know it, I know it really well and I love it. And I still luckily I can, would get to have elements of my life that have that. Like I'm going to be doing a series of programs coming up that are going to be international, uh, going to California, and then I'll be working out in um, uh, most likely, well, hopefully doing some programs in Europe and then and then quite a few programs in um, uh, probably in Jordan and Bangladesh and then hopefully in, in Uganda. And it's like that, and, and, and when you're doing that now, it's a little bit different. It used to be like, okay, Let's, let's, let's duct tape it and make it happen. And now it's like that. And I need to meet with like the country director of UNICEF. I need to meet with like the country director of like the European Union's representation here, like whatever it is. So it ends up being like a little of a balance, but the, the ethos and pathos there of what you're talking about is like the same as mine. And it, it grew out of that. And now yeah. it's kind of, yeah. Yeah, I thing. mean, it's funny when you say that because I feel like it, it kind of opens to me a door, which is like, that that vibration of go and do it like oh you want to be a musician like find a van don't worry too much <laughs> you'll be all right you know find a van find some musicians and go do it <clears throat> and what that can lead to it you're an example of and i feel that like um as as obviously with with my band you know we are stepping much more you know we're not really as much like that, because I mean, there's, there's like a, there's phases of life, you know, and as, as you know, you start to be like, okay, well, I don't want to have to tuck tape the wheel on the van <laughs> as we drive down the road. You know what I'm saying? I'd rather just have a nice van, <laughs> um, and go do, you know, um, right. and even though that, <laughs> but it's like, we can, we can also like, we, we through our story, you know, and it's in, especially you we can impart that to the younger generations. Like put down your phone, go follow your heart, you know, and, 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 and like, let that, let, don't, don't be like, how am I going to, cause I mean, think about it, what you've done. I mean, could you have said, I'm going to end up doing, I'm going to end up having projects across the globe and I'm going to end up you know, running this, this beautiful organization that's like affecting millions of lives it seems you know um or at least hundreds of thousands or whatever i mean maybe you could have but you know I, for me like i could never have guessed where i was gonna get to go with the copper children you know and it's like it all started with a feeling and 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 they like a wild hair of like i'm a musician and i need to go and play music and no one understands me, you know, like no one's like, I had very, you know, I mean, my parents didn't not understand me, but it was like, they couldn't have, no one could have kind of like given me permission to go out and, and do, do it, you know? And so it's like through this story, we can show like this, this wild, like kind of like grab, grab the paint and go to the refugee camp and like, see, you know, that can lead to doing these things amazing map things, you know? And I think like so many of us want to do big, beautiful things, but um, it starts with following your heart, you know? Asking permission, yeah. Yeah. 
And I feel like a big, a big part of that. I mean, it's, it's really interesting that you should use that analogy of like, oh, I, after a certain point, I don't want to duct tape the, 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 you know, wheel on the, on the bus any longer. Right. And it's kind of funny. Like there's all kinds of things that I used to do where I liked the challenge, right? Like I would, I would choose the cheapest flight that would have like three layovers that like would go to all these places that would be like totally absurd just because I enjoyed it. Right. Like, like I would intentionally do these things where I knew and my mom would tell me, you're making your life harder than it needs to be. And I'm like, I know I like choose to do that. You know what I mean? And it's like, like, like me and a buddy of mine, you know, we ended up bicycling from San Francisco to Rhode Island, like cross country. Um, and, you know, it's not the easiest way to do it. We didn't do it in even close to the easiest way. We stayed out in the wilderness. We, you know, we're making street art. We were doing work, you know, across the country um, in a way that was not easy. And that was the point, right? For easy, anyone could do it. But then at the same time, I feel like you get to a certain point where you're like, okay, I need to spend my energy, resources, and effort on the stuff that really matters, you know, for you on, say, on, on songwriting or, you know, focusing on, on, you know, being able to hone your craft. You know, for me, it's, it's same way. Um, and then it ends up being this, this strange feeling that I think many people in the world feel, which is what is our responsibility when we have access, right? We have access to be on a podcast. Right. We have access to be able to have a computer where we're able to communicate. Right. And to have running water, electricity. Right. Like, like we have access to all of these things. So what do you do with that access? Right. How does that access create a responsibility to do something greater than ourselves? And I think that that question is a substantial question when we start thinking about like the era that we're in in the world, whether it be about the environment and and climate change whether it be issues around glo the global displacement crisis which just went up from you know about 81 million people displaced in the world to now we're dealing with you know over 86 87 million people um over the last two months you know with ukraine and so you're dealing with a massive this is the largest displacement by far since world war ii and so you know when you're dealing with a, a massive scale that seems impossible to fathom you know it, it, it becomes something where we start to think, okay, what can we do in the ways that we can do them? You know, whether it be what Jack does and being able to have a podcast that people can listen to and get inspired by, whether it's what Zaya does and listening to music and feel like you can transcend yourself, or whether it's what we do with our illusion of being able to hopefully create kind of the next movement in the history of community-based public arts and education. What we ended up doing, what we're all doing is saying, okay, let's do something. And, and even if you're fighting for a droplet of healing in a sea of pain, right? That one droplet is worth it because it just takes one droplet to make ripples, right? And that those ripples are the effects that we don't always know, right? Like that person there who listens here to one song and is like, yo, I am so inspired. I'm going to go do this. Like I think about the bands that inspired me when I was young or that I listened to that inspired me. I'm like, yo, a small part of everything I do, I have to attribute to those bands that I was thinking of when I was listening to that music, right? Or somebody who listened to a podcast is like, you know, I'm going to go start my own organization or I'm going to go join a band or whatever it is. Um, I think we don't know what the cycles of actions can be, but I think we do know that we need to do whatever we can to make more and more of those drops. Lyrics, I've got, you're writing the song here. <laughs> Jack, Jack of healing, a sea of pain, ripples of inspiration. <laughs> Very poetic, right? Ah, yeah, that, was that was great. Man. <laughs> I hope you're going to do the artwork for the single as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll I'll do the cover, right? I'll do the okay, cover, yeah. Right there. Yeah, that sounds great. Cool. I love it. <laughs> man, I feel I feel very inspired um, by this. Uh, I agree with you. The droplets, you know, in a sea of pain. I think that that's a beautiful analogy and i think like um i think you know it's so easy to kind of always think on this massive scale you know and i think that um bringing it back to the droplet is such an important and beautiful mm -hmm. um thing because i i i've i've seen like at our concerts for example you know cuz we play love based music. I mean, I consider when we go, when we play concerts, I consider it a ceremony. Like we're going into ceremony because we really 
consciously try to dive in with people, you know? And we try to play like vulnerable music, like music that's human, that like music that breathes in the room it's in, you know, and like music that, um, you know, music that plays the strings of the hearts that are, you know, in the room. Um, and it's, it's aware music and we take it. I don't like serious because we're very, we're the, called the copper children. <laughs> Um, so it's like, I, I, we're kind of the antithesis of serious, but at the same time, we do take what we do seriously in the sense that, um, we've witnessed it affect people in a way that's, you know, I mean, I, I, since I began, I've witnessed just me on the journey of singing. I've witnessed people blossom when I sing. And I've always thought it was such a gift that like, when I sing, people want to sing with me. They don't want to like be like, oh, he's too good. I can't, I, you know, people, when I sing, people want to sing with me. So I was always like, that's such a gift that my voice inspires voices. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't um, make people want to like, uh, you know, some people will say, I'll never sing again. He's too good. You know, it's like my voice makes more people want to sing. So getting that feedback consistently it just made me want to keep sharing my voice because I felt like I'm sharing my journey with the world. When I sing a note, I'm sharing the journey that I've had of singing, you know? I'm sharing all the pain and all the letdowns and all the beauty and the triumph. I'm sharing every drop of that when I sing. And so <laughs> when people hear, they hear the journey and they can um, <laughs> create their own they can, they can start to incubate their own, um, I guess, their own journey into what they want to express. Um, and I always just thought that was such a gift. And not only that, but, you know, I'm, the thing is, is I always thought like, I, 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 I always loved touring because it's like, I felt like we're getting the real news. Like, if you really want to know about New York, like go there and, and go to a, a, go to a supermarket, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> in Rochester and you'll get some news, you know, like, um, Wagman. but, uh, <laughs> but I always, you know, I always thought touring is a great way to kind of check in on the world, you know, um, in a, in a way that you can actually witness what like, Oh, this is, you know, what it looks like. But, um, you know, throughout, throughout my time with this band, you know, to see people, you know, to see some people be like, you're our favorite band, you know? And, and it's like, we're not even, we're, you know, we're, we're doing good, but we're not, um, you know, to see people just have these beautiful experiences at our shows and to have it be like, you know, like your music saved me, you know, and like, um, to have many of our close friends, you know, give us the feedback, like, um, thank you, you know, for what you do. And I think like, it's so cool talking to you because I think that my music and, and our music, because I want to give love and appreciation to all the creators, which is the Copper Children, which is much more than just myself. Um, but uh, our music, um, it inherently has done, it inherently has affected little water droplets in the sea of hurt, you know? And they're little universes themselves. They're little, they are seas, you know? Every droplet is an ocean. Um, but uh, um, to, to take it now to this next level of like, okay, so we obviously can make music that's beautiful, that affects people. Because I've had thoughts, like I, I, on our new album, there's a song called Beverly Ann. And um, I had this thought, like, I want to make a song that's like going to save somebody, you know, like in their darkest moment when when they're on the brink of that decision between life and death, like I want this song to, you know, I just had that thought and whether it does that or not, I don't know. But that was like the foundation of kind of like what I, like this part, like suddenly she wakes up, heart beats softly. The gift of life is love. She knows cause she can feel again, you know? And it's like, Oh, I can feel again. Like I, I, I can feel the gentle tenderness of life again. I've lost it, you know? And um, I just, but um, as I was saying, 
it's great talking to you because I feel like I'm getting a window into kind of what can be the next phase of where I'd like to take it, which is intentional in the sense of, you know, I can't help but look around the world. And I mean, I cry for our waters, you know, I cry, you know, I cry for the rivers. I cry for, you know, the plastic that clogs our oceans, you know, um, I cry for, um, you know, the beetle, you know, I just, I just, there's so much that's, that's, that I cry for, you know, whether it's human life, like in the refugee camps and those situations, or whether it's just the state of our living planet in our natural spaces and how much things are changing and how quickly they're changing and how, how little awareness it seems like so often we have, but I can't get stuck in just crying. I have to now, okay, what can I do? You know? So, so I'm getting to see a glimpse into like those conscious steps I can take that are like, okay, this is a beautiful music. I feel like creator is giving me this gift to have this platform. Now, what can I do with it? Like, let's take this and let's make it like, let's sculpt our world, you know, let's not just, you know, like it's intuitive and it's beautiful, but like, let's, let's like use this presence and this focus and this creative, like pure source. And let's like zero it in to like make the world directly a place that, that will be a place where many generations can come and flourish here because there are going to be children and I won't see the fruits of my labor to the degree that, you know, like, that's the thing is we, 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 I want to plant seeds for thousands of years, you know, like, because I know that there's going to be many children after me, you know, and I, I just feel like deep love for those to come, you know, and I, and I want them to have a world that they can enjoy. So. You do. Well, I, yeah, I love that. I think that's so true. I mean, thinking that long, like you're talking about like history, right? Like thousands of years to come, right? We want our like impact to be there, right? That we made a mark, right? Like the caves of Lascaux, right? Which were the first people to, you know, put on the wall, right? And be like, I'm here. I matter, right? Exactly. And you look at that and you think, okay, what is, um, <clears throat> what is what we're doing? How does it matter? Right. And, and, and you just gave some great examples, like, like saving someone's life or somebody being like, yo, like you love your band. You are my favorite band. You changed my life. Right. And I think about it and I'm like, how, how do we share that with others? Right. Like, how do you share that feeling with yeah. others, you know? And like, that's a really important question. Like for me, you know, our illusion is far larger than myself. Just like you said, copper children is, is much larger than yourself, right? And when you're dealing with something bigger than the self, then it immediately becomes this thing where you think to yourself, okay, so at, I'm waking up in the morning and other people around the world are all waking up in the morning and they wake up and this word for us, our illusion is a huge, it's, it's more than a, like an organization. It's an idea. It's a feeling, it's a movement, right? And so for, and so for all those reasons, there ends up becoming this, this value of saying, I'm part of something bigger than myself, right? And I, and, and I think a lot of people can, the arts do that. Like they are catalytic, right? They, they create a catalyst of feeling like I can become more creative. I can pursue my life stream. I can do something that really matters because I, was inspired by this painting or by this, you know, musician. And that's what makes the art so close to magic. Like, that's why we all have our own mythologies. And you think about that cumulatively and like, Jack, every person that you've ever interviewed, right, lives inside of you, right? Every child I've ever painted with or made art with lives inside of you. You know, Zaya, every person, you know, that, that you've ever performed to lives inside of you. So we become these manifestations of all these people thinking how can the arts be a way to continuously make a greater and greater impact into their lives? How do we pay them justice? Like Muhammad Noor, mm -hmm. right? Like who I, who I told the story about. 
Like he's right here on my shoulder being like, hey, make sure to represent me because I really matter and, I, and, I, and I'm not represented, right? And I think that that really matters. And that when we have the opportunity at every stretch of the imagination, like to take the chance, right? And, and, and I think that's one thing which like, I don't know, you, 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 you clicked on this a little bit, Sam, but it's like, at what point, you know, do you say, okay, this is what I do, this is what I'm really good at, this is what I put all my effort into, but there's all these other things I need to make sure to do to make sure this can, th then can flourish and thrive, right? And I think that matters as well, because so much of the time we focus on like just, just the passion and the issues. I've met some of the most talented people in the world who are so talented and so passionate and, and driven, but they don't have the like logistical reality to bring it into the real world. Mm. Right. Mm. And it's like, it's like, yo, if you're going to be in a band and you're going to tour, like you got to have like tour dates and you got to be able to get to the venue and you got to be able to transport all of your, you know, sound equipment and you have to, you know, there's all of this stuff. You got to make a website. Right. And the thing is, is all of that stuff I think we take for granted, but actually like that stuff is really important too. And I think as time has gone on, I've realized that actually they're both the art. Like being able to negotiate a long-term contract with the United Nations and having to send a thousand emails to make it happen and go through a ton of compliance and all of this stuff that's not fun. Like that is what allows then, you know, Dildar or Rishmi, like our, our teaching, our female teaching artists in the Rangi camps, it's what allows them to, to, to express themselves and to work with children to get them to express themselves. So, so it's like, how could that not be part of the art? Like it is, it's just something that takes a very different set of skills and a very different set of patience. And so, you know, starting to realize that there's like, it's kind of a, it's a give and take for realizing that it's like in order to really make a difference, it's holistic. Like it happens with people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cause it's all these baby steps, isn't it? Cause you're, you're at the top of this mountain now. We see you, you're this NGO, you're this professional. You know, and and and, and tires with this, the fit the copper children is a finished product. You know, but you don't see all these, like these thin little things that have pushed you on. Like I heard you in another interview say that the one problem was that all these you you had these wonderful experiences, but then people said to you, "When are you coming back?" And that's not what you wanted to hear, because so you were pushed on. It's like carrot and stick, isn't it? You were beaten. You were, you know, what I mean. You had to do these, you had to build this organization because it wasn't there. Well, and, and, and making sure that people are asking, as you said, like the right questions, right? So like, you know, the questions, cause there are wrong questions, right? And I say that there, let me phrase it. There are no wrong questions, but the question that people were asking when that was happening was when are you coming back, mm -hmm. right? When are you going to come back to do more projects? Inspire me. Right, right. When are you going to bring back to bring the inspiration? It's like, yo, no, you have the inspiration living inside of you. Like that inspiration is already there. Mm. We just need to make sure that we provide an environment, a safe container, a safe space, a brave space, an inspiring space where you can be supported to do that and to put food on your table. Right. And that's, and that's a wild concept where it's like, how do you create a brave space, safe space, inspiring space? And then how do you make sure that a person can continue to live, right? And I think so much of the time artists are like, well, you love to do this. So like, why should, you know, you be paid to do this? And it's like, actually, no, like that's why we should be paid to do it. And especially in places where people may not have other opportunities, you know what I mean? And so in certain circumstances where we are, like we provided the first job that somebody has ever had. Um, and that's an interesting, that's a big kind of like Atlas with the world, you know, on our shoulders, not my shoulders or Zaya's shoulders, but the, it's, it's on the shoulders, you know? And I think when, you know, as we move forward in life, I think there becomes this question of like, that doesn't just stand still. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't just like, our life is not just like, okay, well, we just do it again and do it again, do it again. It's like, how does this shift? How does it grow? And I believe things like, you know, coalitions, cooperations, you know, collaborations, like you have to work together. We live in a competition-based society. Right. I mean, inherently, in so many ways, the free market system and the world that we live in is a competition based world. And there are positives to competition. You know, I don't get me wrong, but I believe we need to change, you know, all these little NGOs competing against each other, all the different bands, you know, competing against each other and say, no, we need to work together 
and find a way to create a far greater impact than the sum of its parts, right? Like that's the goal. And I think that, and I think that if we can do that to take, you know, musicians and artists and podcast makers and say, okay, how can we benefit from each other and with each other? That's the world we're all looking to build, right? Like that's really the world we need to build because that's what makes the magic real. And I think, you know, Zay, I appreciate what you said about magic because it's like, that's what we do, right? That's what the artists do. And, you know, there are the two sides of magic, right? There's the one side of like the real, true, core, mythological magic, which is like, you know, you're up on stage and you're harnessing something and it's like feels magical, right? You are in a community and making a painting and everyone's jiving on the same level and you're making something beautiful and building a giant sculpture together and it's magic. And then the other side is setting up the magic, right? Setting up a, a, a space where there can be planned spontaneity, where bewilderment can happen because all the other uh, variables have all come into alignment. And I think doing that takes a lot of um, very linear thinking that nonlinear experiences can function, right? So for example, like, okay, we have to be able to get funding in order to make this happen. So we apply to get funding. We get the funding. You have to have reporting structures. You need to have monitoring evaluation strategies. You have to be able to convince all these people that they need to bring, you know, public health work or mental health programs or stopping gender-based violence prevention or, you know, being able to have programs on community-based protection methodologies, like all of these things and being like, actually to do all that stuff, you need the arts. So then you plan all of this stuff and then finally it happens and then the magic happens. And it's kind of like, yeah, but the only way that magic happens is because all the stuff that seems like it's not magic, but actually it's part of the magic. So it's that same analogy as before, but really realizing that like to make the magic happen, functioning in reality is really important, number one. But number two, then once it's all happened, actually when you're there making the music, making the art, like it means so much more. And I think that's because you're looking at a long-term perspective to develop like durable responses to these types of traumas. Um, but I will say that it's like in the end, what, what Zaya said, which is like people looking at the story and being like, yo, I could do it. Like I could be the one who wrote that story. And that matters more than most things. I think that's a really important component. I mean, have, have, Zaya, have you, have you had anybody come up and be like, yo, like seeing what you do, like now. Now I'm going to do it. Like, I want to go and make music. Like, have you had any experiences? Like yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's kind of one of the main things that I think we do and continue to um, do. I mean, I, I've i started working again with this program called Art from Ashes. And um, we they, they go into schools, and I'm a guest poet. Um, and they go into schools, and they um, they provide, like, creative writing programs in schools. Um, and one thing I always share with the kids, because I see masterpieces, I'm like, man, you know, like I, I've been, I've been kind of on like a little anger path, but like just in loving anger, <laughs> but it's like just seeing kind of some of the state of our public schools, it's really heartbreaking. And, and I'm just like, I use the example, like hanging a Van Gogh in a porta potty. It's like, that's, um, you know, like our children are like higher masterpieces than I don't even like to compare them to a Van Gogh because that's doing it. That's not doing it justice. What a masterpiece one child is. I mean, it's, you know, that's the true. And I love how you talk about, you know, art going beyond just like a canvas or a guitar and, you know, like, but, um, I, I think like what I, what I say to these kids is like, I just want to share with you what it looks like to be passionate about words and about, and about poetry, you know? Um, so, you know, like you're saying, I mean, yeah, I, I think I've had, I think we've had many people be inspired because I think like the thing is, is we've, we have had that classic kind of like working against the odds you know, but kind of loving this, like working against the odds, like, you know, we're not the, you know, we're not the best band in the world, you know, like we're not the, you know, and I mean, don't get me wrong. We're very talented, but like, you know, we've created something bigger than the sum of its parts. And I think like, to me, I think that's my true passion is to kind of create something magical out of almost nothing. And to like, because like, 
for for example, um, me and my mom, we we went to Senegal three times, three consecutive years, and she actually went six times. And I got a chance to sing for kids there and to um, uh, and to really just be with be with people and play music and and just spontaneously create there. Um, but one thing that I really um note like i i noticed when i was there is just like um like i was thinking like where there's art there's life you know like where where there is art there is life and um uh having the opportunity to um go to senegal and and share the music it just kind of reminded me how like you know like great things are not created because there's infinite resources available. They're created out of this like need to create. Um, and so when you can water that, that deep creativity, like you'll see in somewhere like Senegal, when you can water it with actual like canvases and art, what you see is like, you see rain come back to the, you know, to the dry desert that, you know, you see like, you see the, Exactly. Baobab sprouting from, you know, and it's just like, um, I just, I feel like I, I'm really passionate about, like you said, like, um, kind of creating out of almost nothing. And like, how can I, what, what can we create? How can we show that creating is possible? You know, no matter, no matter what. And like, and as a tool and a vehicle for the spirit to, to be able to, to grow wings and fly again, you know, and to, um, and like you said, I mean, when you go into these places, you, you don't want to go in and be like, I have answers for you. You really want to be like, I have really important questions that maybe you haven't thought about in a long time. And maybe these questions can lead you to the answers that you guys need and the leaders you need, because I can't, I can't, nor do I want to be your leader. You know, I want to show you the leader within yourself so that you guys can create lasting solutions that actually that's when the real work is, right? Is when you, when you, when you help people access the leadership in themselves and then they create it. And then it really means something instead of like, oh, this person came and they saved us. It's like, no, you, ca we came and we showed you what was possible. And now you, with that tool, now you, you do it because it's gonna, it's gonna last if, if you allow like children to do it themselves, you know, like they have to create themselves. They have to, they have to go on the journey. Um, so I, I think I just really want to continue to, like you said, how can I foster an environment for a child to feel like they have, they have um, maybe the resource, whether it be in, in their own heart or in their mind, to actually create the world they want to see and feel like that's possible. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, complete, and, and I think you hit, you really hit the nail on the head with that, which is like, you know, in the end, you're there to share, right? Like we share when you go into spaces, like, I know Senegal is a great example. I know my brother went there to play some music and, 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 and I spent more, much more time in East Africa, um, in, in Uganda and in Rwanda. And, you know, one of the things is you go there cause you're sharing and if anything, you'll learn way more than you could ever give. You know what I mean? And I think that's true in every space I know that we've worked in, like, you know, where you go into spaces, whether it be Jordan or work in Lebanon or work that we, you know, do in Bangladesh or Colombia, you know, you go into a space and you're like, yo, I'm here to learn from you. I'm here to share whatever, whatever I can. But in the end, like, we're here to learn from each other. And if anything, I'm going to learn a thousand times more than I could ever, you know, give. And one of the things that that, that creates that is so fascinating is it creates this experience where you realize that, that especially when people are passionate about something, like 
nothing can build a bridge between like, 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 like can build a wall and that building a bridge is so natural. It's like, like this family experience where like artists are inherently a family, right? Where it's like all artists in the world are a family. And it's this experience where it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter all the trauma that you've been through because you can, you can transcend that through, through the arts and creativity. And that stuff really matters to who you are and how you got to the point that you are. But what you've realized, and, and I think you touched on this, and whether this is like the story of a little kid or of like, you know, an artist who's never been, you know, able to express themselves, to go from being, you know, either a victim or a survivor of trauma or of a difficult scenario that you happen to have been born into, to then becoming an agent of social change, right? And then that transformation to going from being an agent of social change into a maker of history, right? Where you then actually are saying, okay, I came from a really hard position and I'm changing that position. And by me changing that position, I'm actually defining my community and my culture and my existence. And that by doing that, I'm actually shifting the trajectory of the history of, of the now, of mm -hmm of existence, right? That to me, like, that's one of the greatest gifts we can give a kid, right? Because if a kid to be like, yo, uh, I'm not just a kid. I am an, I am an agent of social change. I'm making social change. And that by doing that, I am part of history. I'm not a recipient of history. I am a maker of history. And that we are the makers of our own histories. You know, I think that's so important, whether it be through, through poetics, like you're talking about, or whether it be music or whether it be the arts, or whether it be saying, hey, all this inspires me, but I actually really love, you know, doing math equations. Awesome. That's great. Like, like it's just about being able to find a way to be passionate. Because I think in this era that we live in, there's this very strange binary is like either you do what you love and then, and then you know, you're, you're suffering and working really hard to try to do what you love. Or you don't do what you love so that you can make enough money to be able to like do what you love in the small percentage of time that you have on the reverse, right? And I think in a lot of the developing world context where, where life's a lot more survival, it's like, I need to do whatever I can so that I and my family can live and survive. And if I get to do something that I like enjoy in my life, that's like, that's a benefit, right? But to actually do something you love and make a living and be able to pro provide for your family, that is very challenging for many people all over the world. So it's this feeling like if you get to do what you love and make a living doing it, you're in a very small percentage of people on the planet. And if you, and, and, and actually, if you even know what you love to do, you're like in a small percentage of people yeah. on the planet, right? And then if you know what you love and you get to do it, then that's a smaller percentage. And then if you know it and you get to, and you get to make a living doing it, you're in a smaller percentage, right? And so it's this thing where it's like, okay, what, if you get to be one of those people, and I think very likely the three of us get to be those people, right? Mm. Then, then again, what is our responsibility? I think what Zaya said is a great question, is a great example, like, right? Like going out and being able to make poetry with kids, super important. Like I view what we do to be really important. I think what you're doing, Jack, to be able to get people's messages out to the world is really important. But it's like, if you get to have that many, and, and, and in some ways it's privilege, right? In some ways it's access or opportunity, Right. There's a lot of words you could use to describe that. But once you get to a certain level of that and being like, well, this is what it's going to be for life. What do you do with that? And I think that that's this whole idea of like, can art change the world? Which a colleague of mine named JR, an amazing artist and another colleague named Vic Muniz, I had a conversation with each of them individually and it's like, okay, can art change the world? Well, I think the question is, is you know, art is always changing the world, right? The question is, is, how can art change the world in a way that is really meaningful for you and for those who you're impacting? Because in the end, it has to be meaningful for you too, right? I think so much of the time it's like, well, what are you giving? How is it affecting others? It's like, yeah. But like, as Isaiah as said, like, it'll affect you. Like, if you go to Senegal and you're working with a ton of kids, like, that's going to really impact you as much as it might impact the kids. Right. And going into it, realizing that we have this equitable understanding of what we do, like that really matters for Art Illusion. And that's one of the reasons why we hope that if somebody, for example, donates to Art Illusion and what we do, right, so that, so that our teaching artists are able to live or they're able to do a small fundraiser or something, it's not like they're just giving. They're getting the feeling of being like, hey, what you're doing is really making a deep impact into the world. That matters just as much. You know, it has to be that reciprocal um, 
kind of relation, relational connection, which I think matters so much. Um, but yeah, I deeply agree with everything that I just said. I, I, I super connect with it. Jack, do you have any questions for us? Oh, I'm just, I'm just my head swimming here. I mean, I just, I just so feel so privileged to be able to record this conversation and people listen to it. It's uh, this episode doesn't even really even need a song. You know, it's that inspiring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, just I think David Stalling is in the room somehow, and uh, we owe him a lot of credit. Well, well, David Stalling, <laughs> yeah, okay. Max, you might have to give him a call too. I was gonna Love say, Dave, we should give him like a three way call, like me and you <laughs> should like uh, get a get yeah, call. Like, he won't expect that, right? Like, let's yeah, that would, call together. that would be cool. We should let's set it up. Yeah, let's yeah, yeah up. I would love that. I mean, what's funny is it's like when I saw him last, you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about, I would always call him Mr. Stallings, right? Which is funny, like, you know, how many 20 years later or whatever, 15 years later, I mean, like Mr. Just... Stallings, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's very hard for me to not refer to him that way because he's like, in my mind, it's like Mr. Stallings, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Which is like super funny. But when I had a conversation with him, you know, the thing that I always loved about Mr. Stallings is he was always, and I think this is maybe a lesson for all of us, right? Is is he would, even though he's like deeply embedded in an institution, right? In in the school, right? In the high school, went to Cherry Creek High School, right? He was always finding a way to be subversive. Like, like there was always something about like, <laughs> yo, there's like this crazy political thing happened and we got to figure out what to do. Like we got to make art about the environment or about our waters or about, you know, the pipeline being built. Like there was always something kind of subversive. And I always loved that. It was always like, yo, you can be within an institution, you can change an institution. Right. And that I think can be maybe one of the keys to creating systemic change. Right. Is this idea that like you can be within a system, do everything you need to be the head of an art department, you know, that has a whole staff and everything else you need in high school, but thinking about how can you create kind of a subversive way of making change. And I, I don't know, I, I, I always, I take that as a role model. Um, Maybe that's something you've done now with, because you're dealing every day with world organizations, trying to get funding and trying to get, get them on board and, and trying to say to them that you, what you want, your objective, the solution is art. We can fix our program can fix so you just kind of speak, trying to understand their, what they want and seeing how, how you fit it together. Exactly. And to be like, yo, you have all these pre-existing goals and aspirations and dreams. And then a lot of times it might be called like <laughs> a strategic goal, right? Or our strategy of the year and be like, Hey, you have all these goals. If you use the arts to be able to accomplish those goals, you're going to be able to make a far bigger impact than you would otherwise, you know? And I think that that to me, um, that's, that's, I guess, I guess in many ways, that's like this combination of like advocacy, but it's also like making the magic, mm -hmm. right? Because in the end, it's like, yo, in order to do what Zaya does or what I do or what you do, you got to make people feel like they like are doing something that matters and that they like care about, right? Like, oh, if we bring this music into our space, we're going to feel really good, right? Or like, you know, here, here's an interesting example that I think is a very good kind of like note to be able to bring into the conversation, right? So like there was this one woman named Dildar Begum who we work really closely with. And I share this story as many times with as many people as I possibly can, because I think it's really, really, really important. Is this woman, um, when she was in Myanmar, when she was fleeing her home, her whole village was burned and her father was killed and her husband was tortured and then captured. And, you know, she watched her best friend raped and then killed and had hor horrific experiences. And when she was fleeing with her two special needs brother, her mother and her grandmother, they were fleeing similar experience of digging the holes and covering themselves with dirt and running. And when they, they actually hand wove a raft to get across the river, to get from Myanmar into Bangladesh. And when they got across, you know, she, they, they found a place to live in an area called Lambashia and in a, in a little, in kind of a, a bamboo shack and they were living there and she didn't speak for nine months. She had what we call shock-based mutism. And she spoke for, and, and, and during that whole time she came and she ended up working on a project that we were leading um, at, a, at a United Nations uh, Center for Women Who've Been Through Violence. And the first words, and she spoke for the first time, in nine months. 
And the first words that she said were, I have not felt alive for the last nine months. This is the first time where I'm feeling that I'm alive. And my greatest responsibility is to share this experience with others who have felt silenced. And that my, my greatest goal in my life is to be able to share the experience with children, to other women to express themselves through painting. And over the last four years, she has actually become one of our lead artists in the program, leading programs year round, right? So if we like hold space for Dildar to be in this conversation, right? Like, like she is the reason we're here having this conversation, right? It's not about me, right? Mm -hmm. It's about her. Like she's who really matters. And it's like, to be able to provide that opportunity in the end, it's like, it's like what Zaya was talking about. Like you get that one kid from like, you know, North Denver who like, you know, maybe have recently arrived from Latin America to write a story about their experience and being like, yo, what I have to say matters. Who I am matters, right? I have the right to have a dream. Like that, all of that put together, like that's what we can hold space for. That's what we can hopefully become the, you know, the, the, the seeds that we plant can turn into that at its best. Right. Um, and so, so I, I, I definitely agree those, uh, like we have to be those, those makers of magic wherever we can. And deep respect to David Stallings for planting that seed many years ago. Yeah. I mean, he planted the seed in my mother. So. <laughs> 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 and then can you Thanks, dad <laughs> well i gotta ask you like do you feel like your your father also inspired like your path and like where you've come on your journey i mean absolutely i mean i think like it's a little bit different when you're the child versus you know because totally. my dad behaved a little bit like um Almost like I kind of describe him as like the rock star of art teachers. You know what I'm saying? Like he was absolutely obsessed with his work, you know, and for good reason. And I think that as I got older, I began to see like, man, my dad is truly, he's a master art, te you know, he's a masterful art teacher. And like, um, the amount and the level he's inspired kids. I think that for me, I got, I got dad who was falling asleep at the table, reading the newspaper, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not saying that, that I'm not saying it's just, you know, that that's just the reality sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, he inspired me because he, I mean, because he's my dad and he's a, a beautiful man and he, he love, he loves me. He supports me to this day. I mean, he's always like, what are you doing with music? I mean, he's bought me several things. He helped me buy stuff. So he, he's continuing to support my music and he's like, mm. you got to do this, you know? And he's more, he's, he's more available to be on my team than I've ever, I think I've ever felt and I feel so grateful but not only that um I think that the way that I really got my dad is I really when I, I was actually talking to my mom about this but like he really cares like he truly cares about people and he cares about the earth and he truly wants the best for all people and he he cares and I think that alone is the greatest gift that he could have ever given me is he's he, just him sharing his passion for just how much he cares, you know, and, and him showing, showing me through my life, what it looks like to be someone who really cares, you know, just that alone, you know, and, and obviously, um, yeah, just him walking me through things, but I, I know that he, he gave, he gave a lot to his, his work. And, um, and I, 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 um, I honor that, you know, because it has had such a profound effect on so many people's lives. And I'm, I'm really grateful for being able to witness someone who, 
you know, truly he, he has done what he loves and he's done. I mean, he could be interviewed and eh? he's, he's had an incredible life himself. Um, so I feel grateful. And, and I think like as his child, I've absorbed his lessons and maybe different ways than you might get as like one of his art students, you know? Um, totally. but, uh, yeah, it's, he's shown me a lot and he's definitely been a foundation of who I am now. Cause I, I'm just somebody who innately cares a lot <laughs> about all, all beings. I just really care. So, and I can attribute that to him and my mom. Cause they both have shown me how to really just care. No, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that. Cause I like, I kind of feel the same way about my parents, right? Like I feel almost the exact same way about my parents about like caring and like working really hard to care. There's this amazing quote that I actually used in my doctoral, in my dissertation that really was like a guiding light. Like when I thought about this really hard, it like really got me. And it's from, um, it's from Dr. Cornell West. And he says, the only reason that, that I am who I am is because somebody loved me and somebody cared about me. That's the only reason that I, that I am, or any of us are who we are. And it's this idea that we have innately by the way that we're raised and grow up and live, have the ability to have, to, to develop our own culture of care and developing a culture of care is this idea that like, if you're in a band, right? you're going to really care about the people that you're with. If you're running an organization, if you're, you know, have a group of friends or you're, you know, extended family, you are going to do everything you can to show that you care. And I think that's something that's, it's, it's an iterative practice. It's not like you're there and then all of a sudden you're there and now I care. It's like, it's a daily practice, you know, it daily, you yeah. find new ways to, 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 to prove to yourself and to others and to the world that you genuinely care. And not to fall into apathy, not to fall into, you know, everything is just okay. It's like actually real care, like is not always happy. Like you can have periods of time that are not happy and that's because you genuinely care, you know? And I think, and, and the reverse, right? Like you, like when things are right, because you care, it's really good, then it's really good, you know? And so I think that for that reason, like, what your father and what your father imparted unto you is very different, I think, because for me, I, I like knew him for a series of years as like you know an art student, right? You know, which is which is very different. And I and you know same thing, you know, my parents like it's impossible to make a you know a, 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 to, to look at the parallel. But one of the things that is real is it's like it's almost like saying, you know, I think it's really important to have mentors in our lives. I think it's mm. really crucial. I think when we can have mentors of different types, um, it, it shifts things and different, and there are different mentors for different times in your life who play different roles throughout your life. I think it's really easy to have a mentor and then they just like disappear. What's hard is to care and to stay in contact and to be like, yo, like you worked really hard to be an art teacher. I'm going to come back when I come back to Denver, Colorado, I'm going to come back and I'm going to like sit down with you and be like, yo, you changed my life. And because you changed my life, these are all the things that happen in other people's lives, right? And that to me, like that's genuine care. Going back to a college professor or to that one guy you met on the street who you developed an amazing relationship with me, like you changed my life, right? Like making that effort, especially for teachers, means so much to them. Like it means so much to them. And like that to me, I think it's like, it's, I think we need to do that for our families as well. And I think it's important to do that. But I also think it's like, whether you like it or not, your family's likely going to be, you know, they're there. Whether you talk to them or you're not, they're there. Versus, you know, unless you make an effort, past teachers, colleagues, friends, they can just disappear, you know? And it's really important, I think, that, um, that, that we always pay respect to our elders and where we came from. You know, that's like so important. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing way to have bonded over, uh, over the world of Beastall, especially because it's like, you know, um, I, 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 I don't know. You don't know where your life's going to take you, right? Like you start things and you don't know where things are going to take you. And then, and then you get there and you're like, whoa, how'd I get here? Like, that's crazy. And I don't know if you ever feel this way, but it's like, wow, how did 10 years go by? Like what happened in the last 10 years? And like, wow, it's been a dense chunk of time. Like a lot's happened, you know? Um, so I think all that stuff really matters as well. 
you know, where you're like passing of time is in itself a barometer of where your life's at, you know? Um, I don't know. Have you had any songs that you've written that have been like inspired by like mentors or your dad or people in your life that have changed your life in that way? Me? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that all of my songs are inspired, you know, like I, I think, um, I, um, I often haven't written from a place of direct kind of like, okay, I'm going to write a song in honor of my mentors, which I would actually like to try that more. But a lot of my music kind of comes from this place of just kind of like feelings slash throwing paint on a canvas and and seeing what form takes place and then kind of taking that form um into um into what would become a song but kind of just like you know just kind of intuitively seeing what what happens based on like my emotions and where i am and kind of trusting that like my journey will come out in this intuitive kind of like just kind of go for it and the song kind of appears out of this um general feeling um so i haven't written songs directly about mentors or like although i think it's a cool challenge and i would like to try it just because why not you know but i think that at the same time imbued in every song is is a dedication to you know my mentors and the people that have helped me along the way you know because it's just yeah it's like in my d it's in the dna of my work you know like everything that i do is inherently in honor of of what has inspired it from from you know from my favorite musicians to you know to my favorite uh to just people who've had huge impacts on my life and and been there you know, standing on each other's shoulders. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in the end, I do feel that way about how like what we do is in itself kind of an homage to our, both our mentors, but also like our ancestors and our, you know, many generations that have brought us here and all of the people that we've ever worked with or interacted with. And we hold all of that inside of us and friends or family members who've passed away, right? Like, you know, we hold space for all those people. And I think what if it really matters is it's like, okay, if I'm holding space for all that, like I really need to do my best whenever I can. And not to let that put like pressure on you and to like feel this really pressurized perspective, but rather just to feel like a drive to want to accomplish and to achieve at the highest levels you can. You know, I think that, I think that matters. Um, and then do it look back and feel fulfilled, right? I think fulfillment is probably one of the greatest gifts that we have. And I think, you know, like, you know, my girlfriend, she's a fashion designer. And, you know, one of the things is for her, she feels like, like when people are wearing clothes that she's sewn, like she, that's like really fulfilling for her. You know, I think when people listen to this podcast, it's probably really fulfilling for you, you know, Jack, I feel like that, you know, and that fulfillment is it's one of the most valuable things I think any of us have, mm. right? And so being able to embrace that and to fight for that and to work towards that, because in the end, you know, we're we're operating in two two different sectors that are hugely underfunded and supported. And we need to find ways of, of getting more support, not, and I don't know if financially, I just mean like how how can in every single school in the world, kids are learning about poetry? Like how is in every school in the world, kids are able to make public art? Like every community should be able to have community made meals. Like, like we need to advocate for these things. Um, because only if we advocate, can we start to see real social change, you know? And I think that's really important. I always think it's ironic though, but people work hard to get money, you know, they get, when they become a millionaire, they have a big house and what do they look for? They look for art to put on the walls and they pay a fortune for it. <laughs> right, 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 right. It's funny. Yeah. It's a funny reverse. And it's like, Hey. If they're going to be buying art and they're going to be putting it on their wall and spending a whole bunch of money on it, like, why shouldn't that be an incredible artist coming from a Syrian refugee camp? Yeah. Right? Like, 
And that's one of the things we're trying to do. We're working right on it and hopefully having an exhibition in Geneva um, with the United Nations and, and looking to, to, to try to, again, get art out from these spaces into places where they can be seen and, mm -hmm. and, um, and hopefully to fundraise for, for our team so they can continue to, to make their art. So, you know, and it's, it, it is a strange thing where you have to think about that stuff, but then at the same time, it's like, yo, we have access. We got to do whatever we can, yeah. you know? You talk a lot about this responsibility you, you have it really. You haven't thought a lot about this privilege that you have because we're three white guys, yep. you know, all have privilege and educating, talk, talking about how we, how the, how the world should be different and we don't want to change it. So, but it's a, it's a good conversation to have. It's very important. Well, and it's like, I mean, you just, I mean, you nailed it. And I was going to say that is it's like, we're the ones who all have the privilege and the access. So like, we're the ones who need to change it for the people who don't get to be on this call for, you know, the folks who don't have citizenship or folks who are trans or folks who, you know, are not, it's, it's not about us doing it for others. It's about us opening doors to be like, yo, for some reason I was born into this body in mm. this specific scenario into this specific country, mm. with this specific access. Okay. I, you know, you didn't choose who you were born or where you were born as, okay, well, for some reason, because of the hands that I was given, I can open up a door mm. and, mm. and let someone else walk through, not because I'm walking through, but because they're, because they didn't happen to be born in the same place in the same scenario with the same access. Right. And it's like that feeling like, you know, acknowledging our, our positionality within this really does matter because I mean, just to be honest, so many white men do so many terrible things in the world. Right. Yeah. But so do so many other people, like so many people around the world do, do very difficult things. But if you have access to do something good, that matters. And I think, mm. and I think the kind of thing where it's like, yeah, I, I do think a lot about it. Maybe I, I overly think about it, to be honest. <laughs> I think about it too much, but I, but I also realized that if I didn't think about it, I would feel like I was, um, I wasn't doing mm -hmm. justice to again, all the ancestors and the folks, my, like my family, my family were all refugees actually came over from Eastern Europe and, you know, in the turn of the century and came to Ellis Island and, you know, that's something that lives very strongly within me mm -hmm. of thinking like, okay, I get all this access now, but a couple of generations back, like my family didn't have that access, you know? And so, so you think about that and you're like, okay, what, what, what do we hold within us? That's like the in, intangible cultural kind of heritage of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And how does that end up manifesting in ways that maybe we don't even know? Um, but yes, I do think about, I, I do think a lot about that, Jack, but in, in the end, it all becomes a balance, right? Because yeah. in the end, you also just need to like make make art and have fun. So it's kind of like, you got to do both. But yeah, when you stand in the hall of self-judgment after this time around, I think you've got a great resume. You're going to be, you, you're going to be satisfied with what you've done already. So everything else from now on is a bonus. Well, but. well, in the end, there's, listen, and I remember I was in, I was at Carnival in Brazil in 2020. Yeah. Which is happening right now, by the way. And I'm not there because I'm moving my apartment, but it's okay. Is that I, I ended up seeing this guy, this massive dude, right? Like this is a totally non sequitur story, but it relates to what we're talking about. This massive dude, right? Six foot six, like really big guy. And he was wearing a bright pink tutu and had a unicorn horn and it was like covered in glitter and i'm talking to this guy and and i go behind him and he's and he's oh yeah head to toe covered in tattoos like every part of his covered in tattoos other than his face head everything and and he was like um and i was like, oh can i look at all your tattoos he's like yeah and, he, and i go to the back and i'm standing behind him and he has this and, and and he has this this tattoo of a woman named kiva from the hindu tradition not shiva but kiva and she has like all of these really gruesome images of like holding a decapitated head and like a sight covered in blood and like all of these horrible images. And I'm like, what's this on your back? And he's like, oh, that's Kiva. That's the goddess of the death of the ego. Right. And at the moment that, 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 that she said that, I kind of like, he said that I kind of like collapsed my knees and was just like, oh my God, like this is what matters so much is it's like this feeling that that, that fulfillment, that responsibility, I think a lot of it comes from this battle we have about between our ego and between trying to figure out a way to also have, you know, humility. And it's this, it's a balance because you have to be confident in what you do. But then there's also this, you know, feeling of like, okay, you also need to always kind of respect where you are. We're an ant in the universe. So it's, it's, I, I, the reason I say that is I think it's a daily struggle and it's a daily practice that we are, I'm sure Zaya, you feel that as well, that like, 
however you can, like who you are as an individual compared to as a collective. It's, it's a, um, it's a pulsating ring that like goes back and forth of light that like, you know, we're always battling and also loving and hugging and pushing away and then hugging again. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, that we're inside of, right. But, um, life's an experiment, right. And like, we just gotta, you know, you gotta experiment as far as you can. Yeah, that's one thing I really appreciate about like a lot of the mythology around like, you know, like a lot of the Hindu tales and, you know, all the tales, uh, um, they help kind of give us this like these guideposts of like what's going on inside of us. And they give us these like um, somatic visuals, you know, I'm like, whoa, like that battle between like the individual and the collective or, you know, like. And these things, and they're turned into these epic tales, you know? Like one tale I love is like, I think it's, um, I can't remember, but he's like the god of desire, the Hindu god of desire. And he, I think he manifests as this bee and he's like bothering Shiva because Shiva's like trying to become like this universal, um, like this, he's trying to like let go of all desire and ve- he, he he wants to banish desire. So he like shoots laser beams out of his eyes and he like melts the God of, of desire. And then right as he does this, he realizes what he's done. He's like, oh my gosh, I, I've just like slain. Like he realizes that desire is the fuel of life. Like life would not exist without desire, you know? So then as he cries, his tears land on the ashes and then desire is, is reborn again. Um, but you know, like those epic tales that just like, um, it's like, are they real or are they true? Are they not? It doesn't matter because they're like these interesting, um, they're just these, um, yeah, I, it's, they're like these um, archetypal kind of human experience tales that are brought into like the gods and goddesses, you know, and I just love that um, kind of stuff. <laughs> Droplets on the ashes. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and, and we're all making our own mythologies. I think that's really true, right? Where it's like, you know, we're, we're idea sparring to try to get things that are new, right? We're trying to make new knowledge if we can. We're trying to take those, you know, the droplets on the ashes that you were talking about and create like a phoenix arising from, from the ashes in a new way, right? Like I remember I did this project, which was a really interesting, like almost physical manifestation of what you were talking about, Zaya, where I was working at a rehab center for people who are addicted to narcotics and, you know, addicted to meth and, and all kinds of different uh, substances. And, and I was like, okay, we're going to build this giant sculpture. What is like the image that you want this to be? And then we came up with this whole concept and the concept they came up with was a Phoenix, right? With the story of the rebirth from the ashes, right? And the Phoenix, like, like with the big Phoenix wings and the body, but then the face was actually going to be a mirror. And they said, if we can make it a curved mirror because we're all looking at ourselves. Like we're looking into our own self of how Mm -hmm. we need, how, how we need to rebirth from the ashes. And we built it on the roof of this rehab center. And it was this crazy experience. Yeah, it was super cool. And it was all playable. Like you could play the whole thing. And, and it was this experience where it's like, okay, how can you take a story like that? And then like somehow bring it to life in this universe, in this world that we're living in. Um, And I think that, I think the minute you can do that, that's when it starts to, um, it starts to have this like totally crazy thing where you're like, Hey, I'm living inside a mythological story. Like my life is a a, a myth and, and, and all the characters play this role and they're all creatures and each one is metaphorical. And, you know, I did, I worked for a puppetry performance studio for like seven years doing street performance and, um, playing giant creature puppets, um, starting in Providence and doing work around the East coast. And. You know, one thing is you do is it's like, what's your origin story? Like, how does this creature think, smell, taste, exist? And actually, like, we are all creatures in our own, you know, metaphorical, allegorical ways. So I, I really, I, I love that story that you just shared. I think it's something that, like, is very real, not just to communicate values, but in, like, how we actually 
like manifest creativity. I, th- I think it's very, very real. Yeah. And I think sometimes when you create a tale around it, you, you, um, imbue the mundane or the supposedly mundane with this epic magic, you know, and even kind of circling back into like the mythology of the copper children and us like being these cartoon characters, like taping the, the bus together as we drive down the road, you know, um, I think, like you said, like we can, you know, I think like a lot of the mythology gives us these epic tales to kind of like, um, to kind of place like these kind of very day-to-day things that seem very normal, like, uh, you know, I'm, you know, just struggles with addiction or, or day-to-day things, but not only that, but also like an ability to create our own mythology and to kind of like imbue our, (laughs) our reality with, with that little touch of magic that allows us to continue on through sometimes very challenging times because we have this sense of like the magic of now and the myth- mythological moment that is happening now, you know, and like all the stars that are aligning to create this moment, this breath right now. Well, and, and in the end, you know, I think one thing that you find is like what you're saying with people, especially if you've been through trauma or addiction or, you know, different types of abuse or, you know, different types of major challenges in life, storytelling, right? Like deep rooted storytelling is the foundation of culture and people can come up with these incredible ways of transcending those types of unimaginable pain and challenges and being like, yo, but if we tell the story in just the right way and we're able to communicate this message through this you know, remarkable series of events that happen in this tale, it's a way of us being able to actually kind of regenerate our culture, regenerate our emotions, our feelings, our sensations. And I think that's what cultures have done throughout thousands of years. You know, there've been more wars and conquests, colonization, you know, than anybody could ever fathom. And yet somehow I mean, I mean, look at like um, Santeria or Condomble, right? Where you have these amazing African cultures from the Aruba people who then were slaves and went to the Caribbean, to Cuba and to Brazil. And, and you know, their way of trying, you know, once they're, they're, they were being suppressed and saying, okay, you have to be Christian. You cannot get, maintain your, your cultural beliefs. If they just combined their mythological practices with Christianity, right? Where you, where you had one Orisha or a specific spirit deity would get combined with a specific saint, right? And, 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 and cultures are inherently adaptable, have to be adaptable in the face of adversity. Um, I think it's, I think it's essential. And so when you look at that and you think, okay, what does that mean for the way that we then communicate cultural, um, cultural growth when the culture is actually doing the reverse? Right. I have an amazing, uh, an, another guy who is kind of a, um, a David Stallings type person in my life named, named Garth Quenzer, who's finishing his doctoral work at, at, in Denver. And he created, and he wrote a, a piece and it's called um, The Pedagogy of Imagination uh, and the Disimagination Machine. And it's this idea that we are in a system that, that, that destroys imagination for children because we're not valuing the innate creativity and play and imagination that exists within kids. And that actually one of our greatest responsibilities as teachers or as educators or as artists is how can we battle the disimagination machine to create the pedagogy of imagination? And it's this idea that like we're in this constant battle against a system that does not value arts and creativity in the way that it needs to, for, especially for kids. And saying, actually, like you said, right, the Van Gogh in the, in the porta potty right? Like we need to figure out the way that that Van Gogh is actually not a Van Gogh at all. It's, you know, it's made by Luis or by, you know, Javon or by, you know, Rishmi. It's made by these kids. And like when it's made, we say, actually, your whole community needs to see that you made that. And they need to respect you for it and think maybe you had more talent than they ever thought you had. And I think that intergenerational need for, for, for building bridges is, is just, it's so important. It's so important. And, and, you know, I think Jack, you said you're in the UK. I mean, I think it's, I mean, 
you look at you look at the UK as an example, and it's so important, you know, for being able to build bridges between populations in, in very disparate areas of whether it be London or across the country. I think it's really, I was living in, I had a crazy experience living in the UK where I was working in the Calais refugee camp um, in France. And, you know, that was a crazy experience to go to be spending and be in Bethlehem Green in London and then to like go into, into France and work for like a month there. Uh, of all these people who their biggest dream is to get to the UK and they can't get across, right? There's these huge barbed wire fence. And um, no, so it, it, I think this is not any region specific. This exists all over mm. the world, you know? And so, and so I, I, I super agree though. How do we bring stories in a way that's compelling, innovative, dynamic, super, super crucial. And like a mural is a unique art form. When I was looking about your, looking at your work, it's just so inspiring. I wanted to do murals and because the local school here is just, it's bleak, it's bleak, it's just concrete and it's flaking and it needs painting. And, and it's like when the art form, it's a unique art form because it's in a place like those, those kids you told us about outside the prison or the, the police station, they got arrested. It's, I can't think of another art form, form like, and it's, yeah, makes me want to do one. Well, if you uh, let me know if you want to do it on the school across the way from you, uh, we've done some some great work in the UK. So let us know. Um, it'd be great. And you too, Zaya. You know, I, because you're based in Colorado, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm always looking to do more work in Colorado. Give me a, a good reason to come home. Um, but I, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think this type of work is needed everywhere. You know, and that's mm -hmm. that's what I'm learning more and more. Well, how about, can we help you with a song? I mean, what do you want the song to be? Because this, this is what could be an opera, basically. You've done so many, covered so many areas about mentorship and <laughs> This could art. be like a, could be like a, 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 like we could, like an epic. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Basketball>. Exactly. <laughs> Write an album. <laughs> yeah, full album. But what could, what, how can we serve you with a song? Would, would you need a song for the website or do you need a song to play it? How could... Is there some project we could tie in together or just, or should you just go with the inspiration? Uh, I, I was yeah, just asking, a, asking me. I'm asking you what kind of song. Oh, should cool, we... cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it'd be really cool to have a song that like references some of the different cultural traditions we talked about. I think that would be really cool. Um, I think it'd be amazing to maybe have a song that, um, you know, could be, you know, maybe part of some kind of, um, I don't know if there's like a music video or something that could like highlight some of our work. Maybe that would be a way that could do it. Okay. Uh, maybe, you know, I think, and, and maybe having, yeah, having something that, um, yeah, is, is able to, to take the stories of these folks that we're representing here, like Dildar or Muhammad Noor that we talked about and have, and have it kind of, um, mm. take their stories and, and, and be heard on a, on a larger level. I think that would be amazing. I mean, that's amazing that he became a painter because he's had his home destroyed and he was kicked out of his country. And it's, uh, yeah. Okay, Zaya, that's the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good one. It is a good one. It's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm well. Yeah, and and, and you I know what we were we're not in it for the easiness, but right, uh, right for you. In it for easy, it. I probably wouldn't be in it all at all. Mm -hmm. I can assure you that would be true for <laughs> the for, for, for the both of us, uh, for, yeah. for all three of us. Um, yeah. yeah, that's super true. I mean, the other thing is, you know, one thing that you know we could talk about is you know, finding inspiration, photos, videos, songs that we've recorded already. Cause we do have some songs that we've recorded from our teams. Um, and I'd be happy to share some of that with you and, and feel free to then, yeah, yeah. Use it as an inspiration. I'd be so curious about, you know, what, what it would come out sounding like. Oh, is this the beginning of a big project, I think. Totally. Yeah. And, uh, no, I, th I, I just love, I, I love the idea of what you do, Jack, with, with, with bringing together, like inspiration artists and like being able to make it have a synergy it's real because well, we've we've ordered so many songs about you know ex-girlfriends and and just our, our, di our diary songs so this this is a, we need new <laughs> we need to go to new heights and we need new materials so thank you for, for this love that i yeah. love that that's so good <laughs> yeah. amazing so so does it kind of go and then then like does does Zago and 
kind of take inspiration <laughs> and make art oh, yeah. and send it back to you? <laughs> yeah, we have a bit of back and forth and uh, yeah, we're both super pumped. So I think it's going to be an amazing, it's going to be, a, after this conversation, it's going to be, a, it's going to be the, one of the best songs ever. I'm confident. I love that. Best songs ever. I'm, yeah. I'm super into it. Yeah, that sounds great. So well, let me know if you need anything else from my side. Um, I'm always here to support however I can. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll just stay on for a bit with Zaire and have a, have a chat about what we can, what we can think we can do. Okay, great. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say is if at any point it'd be helpful throughout the song to share any like audio recordings I have of other music from like, from, um, like of the folkloric musicians in Bangladesh or, you know, some of our amazing hip hop artists that are out of Uganda or some of the really amazing oh, music right. from, uh, from, from the Syrian camps. That's definitely something we can, we can think about too. Um, how to like mix any of that stuff in. It could be, could be pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was so wonderful to meet both of you guys. Well, Zaya to see you after 10 years, Jack to, to, to meet you. And I really hope we can, you know, we can commute, we can stay in, in touch. Um, Jack, if I'm, if I'm in the UK, I'll let you know if you're in New York, that's where I'm based currently. Um, and say when I'm in Colorado, I would love to see you. And if you make it up to New York, just let me know. Would love, love, love to get you. Yeah. Up. I have your number now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll, and we'll do a, a three-way call with, with your dad. We'll, yeah. We'll let's that. <laughs> You'll love that. I think he definitely would. Um, yeah. Amazing. Well, you guys have, have a, have a beautiful conversation to conclude it and let me know if there's anything else you need from my side. And I guess I should say for the podcast is that if anybody's looking to be involved in our work, right, that, that they can follow us, um, at artolution.org or, you know, on Facebook, Instagram, on, at, at Artolution. If anybody wants to donate or to do a fundraiser, they can get it being contact and it's just info at artolution.org. And, um, then anybody can feel free to be in contact with me however they can and please support however possible. It just means the world to us and our teams around the world. Yeah. If everyone who listens to this just gave a dollar or $5, just a cup price of a cup of coffee for this, for this, if you've been inspired by this conversation, the, just a little, little transfer, if everyone does it, that would really, really help. Right. And $1 like goes a really long way in a lot of the spaces we work in. And so, you know, even whether it's a dollar, whether it's saying, Hey, I'm just going to like do one of those, you know, Facebook fundraisers or whether it's totally separate, be like, Hey, I know this organization who we should connect them with. Like that could be really good. So there's all different kinds of ways of supporting and just awareness, just sharing our work as well. So, um, you know, and, and we'll do the same for copper children, uh, however we can. So, uh, yeah, so much gratitude to both of you really, really appreciate the, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Yeah, Pumping perfect. you full of energy to keep doing the work you're doing. Keep the energy, yeah. energy, 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 energy. <laughs> and, and the same back to you, back to both of you guys. Okay. So um, let me know if you need a follow-up call. It's so good to, to talk to both of you. All right, mate. Right, bye, got you. Take care, guys. All right, take care. Safe journeys. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow. Bye. Oh, wow. Oh, what a guy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get much better than that oh that was that was a five-star episode thank you so much for setting up yeah my pleasure yeah. i'm really glad i'm really glad that that you know came together and i remember when when i thought of max i was like i have to it has to be him it has to be him yeah yeah, yeah. like it can't it has to so i i actually called my dad and i was like you gotta call max and you gotta tell him about pod songs Tell him that someone's going to reach out to him. Oh, yeah, you did that. Did yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh. I was like, I want to make sure, you know. Because so. <laughs> I just, he just seemed perfect. Yeah. yeah, this is, this is the format. This is what I would like every episode to be like. You know, this is, this is raised the bar on pod songs. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, I mean, just makes you feel like. You know, I, I, I did some traveling myself. I was in, I went through Indonesia, you know, when I was backpacking and touring, I did cows concerts and I went through Indonesia one time and I was in Ramadan and, and sorry, it's Malaysia actually on the, uh, on the East coast and people had never heard live music because it's like, it reminded me of what, what Max was saying that people, people didn't have that encouraged in their culture. So it's kind of mind blowing and it makes me want to go back and do more of that 
really inspired me to because you don't, you forget what you, what, what is ordinary to you is amazing to other people. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think like it's, it's, it's definitely reinvigorated me in the sense that I feel like I definitely, ha I feel I share a kinship and it's, I just appreciate his like kind of direct action. Yeah. And like, I love how he's kind of sees the art in, in, you know, kind of the more business side of it, the art of the mm. business side and the more logistical sides because they are a part of the art. You know, they're a part of beautiful production. It has huge logistical workings, you know. Mm, mm, mm. Um, but one idea I'd had when I was in Senegal was like to to collect instruments in in, a, in the United States that our people aren't using Mm. and to like send them over to Senegal, you know, and somehow have a way of distributing them to, to kids who don't have, you know, cause a lot of kids, you know, what, what to you is the guitar sitting in your closet yes. with one with like one missing high E string, mm. you know, to a kid in, in Senegal is like a universe of possibility, you know, and it's like a guitar from so America. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So I, 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 I kind of, I want to reinvigorate that idea and think about how I can really pursue that. Cause I remember when I was in Senegal, um, I was actually blessed. Like they, they were like, we're blessing your mission for this. And we're, mm. we're sending, you know, they, they blessed me like, um, with on that mission. Um, and I was just like, you know, such a big it was such a big task to me and I, I got a little overwhelmed trying to pursue the music career and at the same time do that so it's kind of reinvigorated and made it seem much more kind of reasonable and not even that you know mm -hmm. copper children gig over in senegal or, or touring africa yeah. Or, yeah totally going to senegal and like yeah and, and I, I just yeah i'd love to collect instruments and and bring them there too yeah yeah about that wow you don't need permission you don't need you don't need an organization to tell you you can do it. You can just, he didn't no, get anyone. Collect, yeah. yeah. You just collect donated instruments. Yeah. Yeah. So put it in a, put it in a crate and send it home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I'm in the spiritual organization, the Ethereum society. And one of the tenets is that once you reach a, a certain level, instead of going forward, advancing. You stay back and serve. So you do, you give up the thing that you can do. So obviously he's a great painter and he could have kept doing, and he's traveling around doing this painting, but he put down his brush and, and you know, had back breaking work on the computer, like he said, in, so that other people could do it. And that's kind of the, that's like, it seems to me like when you reach a mastery level, you don't become, you don't sit there doing your oil paintings or you, and so you, you give, give it up so that others can do it really, really. That, that really touched me as a spiritual spiritual thing he's doing yeah definitely definitely like um yeah i agree i think it's yeah it's um it's just the layers and layers of yeah it's it's yeah totally <laughs> Maybe that's the best note to end on. Maybe I feel really yeah. emotional now. I feel really, I think, I think we can, I think we've, we've peaked. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, good luck with the album launch tonight. I wish I could be there and, uh, I'll check out the photos online and I'm sure it'll be amazing. Yeah. It's going to be fun for sure. Thank you. All right. And then what? Let's yeah, do a song. That gets, yeah. Yeah. Let's do a song. Let's follow up. Maybe he can send us some of his little sound bites and, or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. And we'll just. We'll make something happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we've gone to, we have responsibility yeah. now. We can't, no. I can't stop this episode. No. Yeah. I, I have no. to speak afterwards. Unfortunately, we didn't really make some, some acoustic. <laughs> no, it had to be an epic. It has to be a amazing yeah. song. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> all right, mate. Well, you have a great one. You too. All right, Isaiah.
All right. Talk to you soon, Jack. Take care, brother. You too. Bye-bye. Peace. Art can change the world. Art can change the world. Paintbrush in a child's hands. Watch her universe expand. Color canvas with her love. Sharing joy in creation. Art can change the world I can change the world Young man with his first guitar Transported to worlds afar Sharing songs with all the world Melody so magical Art can change the world You can change the world Every moment is a chance to give To someone who's hurting Who's so deserving of a miracle Art can change the world we can change the world sculptures in refugee camp reminds us of our humanness come together as one blood see what we're capable of Art can change the world We can change the world Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the song and the episode. The song will be released next week. It will be available on all streaming platforms, but you can already pre-save. Please support the artists by following them on social media and adding the song to any playlists you have. This is a completely free show, and you've listened this far, so I'd really appreciate it if you could pay us back by clicking like and subscribe. And follow at Podsongs on social media platforms, or subscribe to the newsletter at podsongs.com for special updates. Or just tell the next person you see about this amazing show where musicians interview their idols and write a song about them. The songs are available for download from the Pod Songs website as well, which pays a lot more than the 0.00 whatever we get from Spotify. You can also email me at jack at podsongs.com to give feedback, suggest an artist and guest combos you'd like to hear, or just say hello. We're a listener-supported show, and I'd love to hear from you. A final thanks to my researchers, Dory Verbo and Rosa Marino. My producer, Maurizio Sanicola of Goldmine Records, and musicians, Massimino Vozza and Luigi Falcioni. The next episode will be out soon. In the meantime, you can listen to more amazing episodes in the archives. Until then, have a great day. <laughs>